Hi, I'm Michael Halpern. Thank you for joining me today as I do some thinking out loud. The first thing I've been thinking about is human flaws. Flaws and flaws that happen all the time. To have flaws is to be human. We are all flawed. Even the best of us are flawed. Despite our flaws, though, perhaps because of our flaws, there are valuable and important teaching lessons that can be gleaned from our actions. And that holds true for all of our actions, the good and the bad. That holds true for our heroes. Moses, the greatest of prophet, is my hero. He was the only prophet able to speak directly to God when he wanted to, in real time, not in a dream. Every other prophet was called by God on God's schedule. That's important. Moses was able to speak directly and according to his own timetable. God commanded Moses to speak to the rock in Exodus. We all know the story. But instead, Moses hit the rock. The end result was the same. The rock gave forth water. But Moses disobeyed a direct order from God. A direct order. And to the people, it appeared as if Moses had performed the miracle and not God. And that's where the problem arose. Moses made a mistake. And he was punished for that mistake. But we still elevate Moses to the pinnacle of all prophets. He remains to this day the person closest to God. He has not been written out of the Bible because of his mistake. He was human, and we recognize that he was human, as did God, which was very important. Fast forward through history, and we find example after example of great men and great women, people who changed the world for the better, but who had, alongside their greatness, great flaws. Actually, I would go as far as to say some of the greatest of people had greatest flaws. FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was a great president. He instituted the New Deal. He brought economic recovery to the country. He took the United States through World War II, and he was great for Jewish immigrants who saw him literally as a savior. And yet, it was that same FDR who refused to meet with Jewish leadership to brainstorm and think about how to resolve and attack the Holocaust. He just wouldn't meet with them. He refused also to bomb the railroad tracks leading to the gas chambers or the crematorium. He was also a person who refused to do what he could to halt and even minimize the atrocity of the Holocaust. And yet, he is still nonetheless a great president and great hero. There are numerous statues of American heroes who are anti-Semites. Anti-Semites of the highest order. In West Point, let's say for instance, the army erected a statue to George Patton in 1950 and then rededicated it again in 2009. Patton, General George Patton, was one of the most important generals in the history of the United States. No question about it. It is Patton who was mainly responsible for the defeat of Nazism. It was Patton who was tasked with dealing with the aftermath of the Nazi concentration camps at the conclusion of World War II. And it is Patton who called Jewish survivors locusts. Patton called Jews subhuman species without any of the cultural or social refinements of our times. That's actually a quote. And like many other American heroes who happened also to be anti-Semites of the highest order, there are statues in their honor. Patton is still standing at West Point, still admired as it should be. Henry Ford, let's say, for instance, known as a great automaker and industrialist, he has a statue saluting his achievements. Many schools are named after Henry Ford. He is less well known for having printed and distributed the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. One of the greatest forgeries ever written. Fake news at its highest. A book that he believed, and this is important, claims that Jewish leaders met every hundred years in the Jewish cemetery in Prague, communists and capitalists together. They secretly met in Prague every hundred years to plot the control of the world. 
Ulysses S. Grant, the great Civil War general of the North, responsible for freeing the slaves and defeating the Confederacy, expelled all Jews from Tennessee, all of them. Pegleg Stuyvesant, uh, Peter Stuyvesant, he was known as Pegleg Stuyvesant, was the governor of the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, what is now New York. He hated Jews and referred to them as, quote, deceitful race, such hateful enemies and blasphemers of the name of Christ, unquote. Martin Luther, who founded Protestantism in 1507, he was such a rabid hater of Jews that German and Norwegian leadership of Protestantism officially rejected and condemned anti-Semitism that he had in a public declaration in 2015. That's hundreds of years later. Should his statue be toppled wherever it is? And there are many of them. Should the statues of any of these people, these heroes, be destroyed? Of course not. The point should be clear, and this is an important consideration. The statues and memories of these leaders should not be eradicated or torn down or defaced or destroyed. The crime is in blotting out their memories, their images, their names can be used, should be used as educational tools. Use them to teach about the complexity of character in each of us. Teach about the good they accomplished and the foibles they fell prey to. Even emphasize their foibles. Teach their mistakes. Talk about them as human, not as saints. The Nazi death camp Auschwitz encapsulates it all. Telling and teaching about the horrors that happened in Auschwitz, the most notorious of all camps. All camps, not only Nazi death camps. It was the worst of all camps. The example par excellence of all of it is critical in understanding what happens when one group thinks they are superior to everyone else. Seeing the enormity of the death process and the machinery that was created purely for the purposes of murdering all Jews is deeply moving. So moving that visitors to the site, which is in essence the equivalent of one large statue, right? An educational moment. They cry. Of course they cry, not just Jewish visitors, almost every single visitor. They're standing in a place where tens of thousands of people were murdered daily, dismantling Auschwitz. It would be a mistake. It would be irresponsible. It would not be a reasonable step in dealing with hate. Keeping it and teaching about it is. People who destroy monuments think that history is monolithic. It's not. That history is divided into good and bad. It's not and that bad is to be removed in order to correct the mistakes of the bad. That's a mistake. Wiping out history is a true mistake. I was in the Soviet Union in 1987, and many times after that. In 1987, I remember vividly, a Soviet tour guide told her group, of which I was a part, that Russia entered World War II in 1941. I explained that the Soviets entered in September of 39 in an access pact with the Nazis. The guide called me a liar and an anti-Soviet propagandist, and she reported me to the KGB, which resulted obviously in a major interview with the KGB. The Soviets removed that part of history. It was a dangerous thing that they did. It's dangerous then, and it's dangerous now. I've been thinking also about the Jews of Iran. I read with great interest an interview with Iranian chief rabbi Yehuda Garami, the interview was published in Al Manator, an Arab website founded in 2012. In this interview, the rabbi gives spectacular insight into the Iranian Jewish community and to Iran itself. Obviously, Iran's Jews do not publicly support Israel, and that's important. The community appears to be stable in numbers and able to provide for their own needs and education. Rabbi Gorami says, and this is a quote from the interview, I estimate that there are between 20,000 and 25,000 Jews in the country. Most of them live in Tehran, Shiraz, Esfahan, and Karmanashah. Though there are other smaller, uh, there are other small communities too. He went on to explain that uh, <clears throat> and discuss the state of the community, saying, and here's a quote again: "We have total freedom of religion. All the synagogues are open, and Torah classes." take place there. We have all sorts of educational institutions too, including elementary and middle schools. Interestingly, they do not have high schools, and there's a reason for that. We could talk about that at another time, I think. About security, he says, and here's a quote again, unlike in Europe, for example, we do not have guards outside our synagogues and schools. 
And our personal safety is excellent. Of course, we sometimes encounter people who are anti-Semitic, but that happens everywhere. Most of the population respects us and lives in peace with us. What is important is that in Iran, there is no such concept as organized attacks on Jews. Is this interview 100% accurate? Probably not. But it does show an important side of Iran and Iranian Jewish life. Coming up next, points of view. Both columns today come from the JTA, the Jewish Telegraph Agency. The JTA was and is now once again one of the premier sites covering issues related to Jews, Jewish communities around the world, and Israel. It had fallen in its reputation, but now it is uh, once again a site to visit in dealing with these issues. First up is a column by Yehuda Kurtzer. It was published on June 5th, 2020, entitled Pluralism is a Jewish value, but pretending all ideas are equal destroys democracy. Kurtzer is an Orthodox rabbi and is the North American president of the Shalom Hartman Institute. Kurtzer tries to thread the needle about the publishing of Senator Tom Cotton's op-ed in the New York Times. He does an excellent job of dealing with the Jewish side of the equation. But he deliberately sidesteps the central issues of this piece and the Tom Cotton piece and focuses on the Jewish side. This is how Kurtzer begins. It was only a matter of time before we would hear a Jewish defense of the New York Times decision to run an opinion piece in favor of unleashing American troops against Americans on the grounds that publishing the piece exemplified the Jewish tradition of spirited debate. The argument takes the ideal of rabbinic pluralism, weds it awkwardly to ideas of freedom of expression, and the stereotype that Jews are a quarrelsome people and suggest that not airing Senator Tom Cotton's essay augurs the end of argument. And worse, that to oppose this position is to oppose the pluralism at the heart of the rabbinic tradition. This argument, this is Kurtzer again continuing, this argument is wrong about pluralism and wrong about the rabbinic tradition. And if we value the rabbinic understanding of pluralism, we must defend it against misuses, especially those of violent consequences. Kurtzer now lays out the essence of the discussion in Jewish life and rabbinic perspective. And this is actually where he is most um, powerful and most positive and most correct. The central problem with the argument that all perspectives should get equal airtime is that it strips true pluralism of its ability to reform and transform societies. True pluralism is not moral relativism. It is rooted in the belief that truth itself includes a diversity of viewpoints, and it translates into the commitment to build societies of mutual respect. Pluralism is a belief system in which we make room for the opinions and whole selves of others, and a tool to build a society that is improved by the presence of difference. E pluralis, e pluribus unum, if you will. The Talmudic rabbis, without question, believed in spirited debate inside their academies. The earliest rabbinic canonical document, the Mishnah, is extraordinary, perhaps the first in history to preserve debate on issues of legal import without reconciling such debates. The Talmud, which dramatically expands the canon in the depth and description of rabbinic debate, famously suggests that the divine voice interrupted a ferocious argument among the rabbis to declare that these and these are the words of the living God. And this is where the citation often ends, as though it constitutes proof that the point of debate is debate itself. Kurtzer now explains that Abraham Lincoln, in his second inaugural address, suggests that unity is the objective. Lincoln famously said that, quote, we both read from the same Bible, unquote. Kurtzer says, yes, but Lincoln did not cede the floor and ask for the Confederate for a confederate to have equal time in his inauguration? Of course not. This is how Kurtzer concludes the piece. The New York Times opinion section is not a neutral record of different opinions. It is a site of power. Cotton's views may find following among more Americans than I'm comfortable with, but it is fair play. And in the service of pluralistic and democratic society, to not grant him every imaginable venue to air them. It is not a violation of pluralism to hold a line 
while Americans are already dying in the street against the use of military force against them. To attach the New York Times decision to the legacy of rabbinic pluralism and majesty and the majesty of God is to desecrate both of them. Kurtzer is correct in certain ways. The problem is that no side should be afraid of an idea, especially an idea that is different. The New York Times should be a platform for debate, not a bully pulpit against those who disagree. There are correct ideas and wrong ideas, there's no doubt about that. There are disputes, honest disputes between people who differ and hold different ideas. There's no doubt about that either. As long as ideas are presented with respect and presented in a way so that the idea is discussed and not an ad hominem attack, that is a personal attack against those with different ideas. The New York Times and any other newspaper should welcome an idea that people should present an opposite thought of the editorial uh, board in general. That is a part of spirited discussion and intellectual honesty. The problem is that the New York Times has turned those disagreements and turned those who disagree with them into enemies. Even though they published Republican Senator Tom Cotton's op-ed an op-ed which they disagreed with, with the politics of the New York Times. In the end, the New York Times fired James Bennett, the editor who published it. Next up is a column by Ben Sales, published June 26, 2020. It's entitled, Should St. Louis Take Down the Statue of Its Anti-Semitic Namesake? Activists say yes. The obvious question asked by the column is this. Now that so many statues are being removed, what about the names of cities that are named after people who perpetrated oppressive acts like King Louis IX of France? Sales begins by setting the stage. After all, St. Louis is named after Louis IX. So he sets the stage by writing the following. On top of a hill in front of an art museum in the biggest park in St. Louis stands a statue of an anti-Semite. The monument to the city's namesake, the medieval French King Louis IX, depicts the king astride a horse, wearing a crown and a robe, and holding a sword in his right hand. It was erected 116 years ago in Forest Park. It is one of the city's best known monuments. Now the coalition of activists want it taken down because Louis IX persecuted Jews. He presided over a notorious mass burning of the Talmud, issued an order of expulsion against the Jew, his Jewish subjects, and led two crusader armies unsuccessful, in unsuccessful offenses in North Africa. King Louis IX was a conqueror. He was ruthless. There's no question about it. But he was a hero to France. One has to realize that. And now some activists are asking to take down the statue to change the name of the city of St. Louis. Sales continues with his column saying, at a time when statues of Confederate leaders and other figures condemned for racist actions are coming down across the country, activists in St. Louis want Louis IX statue to come down to. A petition launched last week is calling on the city not only to take down, uh, take the statue down, but to change the city's name. People in St. Louis are bracing for possible violence, but no matter what happens, the protest movement is an opportunity to be honest about history. Sales continues and concludes with this. One activist said that, I don't believe anyone should be free of critical historical analysis. He said, it's very problematic if you say that because someone is a saint, they can't be analyzed through, critical, through a critical lens. That's correct. There is no doubt that the more one looks, the more one sees the imperfections of people who are our heroes, indeed. King Louis IX is just another example in a very long list. Coming up, commentary through cartoons, where pictures tell the story. I want to discuss four cartoons today, all with the same topic. Statues, you guessed it. Some are very biting, while some are just simply funny. First up is a guillotine with a statue of Thomas Jefferson strapped inside. The blade is cutting his head uh, off, literally the statue's head off. The pun is biting. Of course, you remember, the French Revolution was notorious for beheading people, the landowners and those others who represented the establishment. 
there is no better example of a person in the United States than Jefferson. He was a slave owner and the most important author of the Constitution. Despite all of his good, there's no question about that, he has some foibles. Next up is uh, uh, a play on three, is three periods of modern history that destroyed great works of art and historical symbols. Three of them. The first, in 2001, the Mamian Buddhas were destroyed by the Taliban. In 2015, ISIS destroyed the ancient city of Nimrod. And in 2020, cancel culture destroyed the national monuments in the United States. Third up is a play on the great sculpture of Rodin called The Thinker. You recognize him, uh, hand on chin. The caption reads, I say we remove the sculpture, The Thinker. It's offensive to all people who don't think. This happens to be very funny, an exaggeration, but nonetheless, still very, very fun. Finally, is a pictoon. And we see two pigeons who have placards around their necks. They're walking around the park, and the placard reads, Save Our Statues. That's funny. In a moment, more of my own perspective and a few predictions. The Iranian media has reported that the head of Iranian Al-Quds force, General Esmail Kani, has been visiting Syria. Tazneen, an official media outlet in Iran, reported that he accused the United States and Israel of supporting ISIS and helping them. And this was actually a speech from Syria itself. Here's the quote from the speech. Given that the ex uh, existence of this group, that is ISIS, is managed by the United States and the Zionist regime, which is Israel, we can be sure that the conspiracies of these two criminal regimes have not ended. Now, this is an important element because what is an Iranian general doing in Syria? And why was he speaking about ISIS? Iran is deeply invested in Syria. Iran has advisors in Syria, as well as weapons in Syria. Kani is speaking about ISIS and pushing the conspiracy between the United States and Israel and ISIS. Iran, through Kani, is trying to lump ISIS and the U.S. together, all three of them. Iran is trying to shape the minds of anyone who will listen. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu recently visited Yemen. Yemen and Israel are fast becoming good friends. but They're doing their best at keeping that friendship a secret. Many Arab countries, Yemen among them, have been working behind closed doors with Israel. Among those countries are Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Dubai, and Oman. On the flip side, there are other countries in the region where their warm relationship with Israel has cooled off. The best example of that is Turkey. Then again, Turkey's chilled relationship with Israel is parallel with the chilled relationship with the United States. So no surprise there. The good news is that the thawing with Yemen and others looks like it will continue for a long time. Even if Israel advances with their own plans to annex the West Bank, especially the Jordan Valley, those relationships will probably continue. Now, the Palestinians have officially rejected and discontinued all treaties with Israel. All of them. It's official. The decision was made because Israel is discussing annexing parts of the West Bank, most critically the Jordan Valley. Israel's not done it yet. They're only discussing it. Maybe this is a real test balloon for the Palestinians. Maybe it's a test balloon for the Israelis. In discussing annexation, uh, the Arab Parliament of the Arab League, a group that discusses issues and presents information to the Arab League itself, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas put forth that rejecting the treaties is not a refusal of peace. Of course it is. Peace is a treaty. Rejecting the previous treaties is a rejection of that. The argument should never, uh, should ever come to fruition, by the way, is indeed uh, the agreement will indeed be a treaty. So you can't cancel all the treaties. That's crazy. One cannot even begin negotiating terms if you decide not to talk. And in this particular case, that's the status that's going on. So I ask, with whom does Abbas want to make peace? Just as the United States puts more and more pressure on China in trade, Israel and China are becoming closer and closer. Israel and China nexus worries Washington like you'd never believe. 
Israel sees the relationship with China as great, expansive, and a remarkable opportunity economically. China wants to invest in Israel. It's got a future there. The United States is not happy with this. So the United States warned Israel. They are saying, do not let China into your country. Do not invest with them. And indeed, when the United States Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, was in Israel recently on a whirlwind tour, he made time for a TV interview and took the opportunity to speak bluntly, directly to the Israelis. And this is the quote. We don't want the Chinese Communist Party to have access to Israeli infrastructure, Israeli communication networks. This is the kind of things that endanger the Israeli people and the ability of the United States to cooperate with Israel. That was a direct threat to Israel. And it is not the first time that the United States forced Israel to drop a big deal with China. Israel has been warned. We've been thinking out loud about a lot today. Now that you know what I've been thinking, let me know what you're thinking. Email me at micah at jbstv.org. Tweet me at Micah Halpern. Tell me what you think. Before we end, let me leave you with one picante piece of information. Did you know that there is a rabbinic concept called Ein Ledavar Sof? It's also translated into Latin as uh, Reductio Ad Absurdum or Um Ad Ridiculum. Okay, reductio ad absurdum or um ad ridiculum. In other words, the notion that an argument becomes totally absurd. Reductio ad absurdum means that it's been reduced to the absurd and um ad ridiculum is that it has become ridiculous until it is ridiculous. The notion that an argument becomes absurd when it's taken to the extreme. Teenagers are famous for this. It's, a, it's actually a symptomatic logic of teenagers. It is the mark of immaturity and unrefined thinking. In rabbinic literature, when the expression Ein Ladavra Sof is used, it ends the conversation. It's the end. The rabbinic principle is saying that logic, the logic being used will not resolve the issue. And if you continue in this never ending vein, the argument will just go on and on in circles. It means the argument or discussion will never be resolved as long as the discussion keeps using the same logic. So the expression means stop the discussion. Ein ledavra sof should resonate with all of us, given the time and the culture we have been spiraling into. Thank you for thinking out loud with me, Michael Halpern. Let's think out loud next week again on JBS.